When we think of mollusks, we're often conjuring pictures of snails or clams. There's a whole class of mollusk with smarts that rival our own, eyes substantially better, and stories of the past that go back almost half a billion years longer than ours. Cephalopods have seen things, and in this video we're looking both at the class as a whole and their most massive representative. This was a Cretaceous monster and the largest invertebrate ever known. And this was no lettuce muncher. Join us as we explore the reign of the Ammonites and follow us as we break down their largest known species and stick around to see what happened to them. The movies have exhaustively covered giant spiders, giant ants, even monster mosquitoes. But one realm that Hollywood hasn't yet got its grubby mitts on is that of the shelled mollusks. At first glance, there may not be much scary about a three meter tall snail. But what if the mollusk didn't have a slippery foot, but instead 10 suckered arms and a pair of long, sharp tentacles that reach out to grab you and then pull you back in towards a beak hardened with iron? Ammonites, while they have the characteristic coiled shell of a snail, were a different form of mollusk. They were cephalopods. And from what we know about their modern cousins, it's safe to say that they were intelligent, social, and frankly rather terrifying. Especially the largest of them, at almost four meters across, and the heaviest known cephalopod, Parapazosia sapenrodensis. Before we get carried away though, let's go over how it got there in the first place. Cephalopods are probably best known to most of us in the context of the fried rings of calamari, but they are so infinitely more than this. They originate so far back that the very concept of a predator was still a fresh and new invention. In fact, they were one of the first animals to hunt other animals, having likely contributed to the so-called Cambrian explosion, when the first organisms figured out that they could save time simply by eating their neighbors. And this triggered a cascade of competitive adaptations and an evolutionary arms race that continues to this day. Cephalopods sat at the top of the food chain millions of years before bony fishes arrived, and they held their own against competing predators by developing hard shells. These were cones at first, some up to nine meters long, but then gradually they became more maneuverable and efficient simply by coiling up. Today, most cephalopods have internalized their shells, with octopuses being left with a pair of tiny, hardened plates called stylets. Squids have a backbone-like remnant called a gladius, and the recognizable cuttlefish bone that washes up on the seashore is the internalized remains of their respective shells. Modern cephalopods are extremely intelligent animals, having evolved around a visual language of color and patterns. They're mischievous, problem-solving, playful, and they exhibit very clear personalities. And they're all still predators. Octopuses are even venomous, using the hard cephalopod beak to pierce shells and inject toxins. In fact, most if not all cephalopods are thought to have a varying degree of venom, with the blue-ringed octopus being known for the strongest, able to kill a person with an almost painless and imperceptible bite that shuts down the body in as little as 20 minutes. So this is a taste of the intelligence, stealth, and lethality that cephalopods have evolved over almost half a billion years. And while they're far from the most dominant life form in the oceans today, there have been waves of dominance throughout their reign. A very small minority of animals ever gets fossilized. Of all species, it's said that only a tenth of a single percent will ever be preserved at most. Animals with shells and animals that lived in shallow, silty oceans certainly have the best chance of this, and ammonites take both those boxes, so it's likely they are disproportionately represented in the fossil record. But even when accounting for this, ammonite fossils are absurdly prolific, especially in Jurassic and Cretaceous sediment. Head over to the Isle of Wight in the UK, where the sea hammers away at Cretaceous chalk deposits, and you can't move without tripping over one and travel back roughly a hundred million years in the same spot, and you'd find yourself floating in the ocean absolutely surrounded by ammonites. Ammonites are some of the best described group of extinct animals that we know of, with perhaps 10,000 or even up to 20,000 species described. This is an astonishing diversity from fossils alone, and really can't be overstated. 
Part of this comes from the mere fact that they were there for almost 350 million years. But even the Cretaceous specimens are truly abundant. Ammonites were coil-shelled mollusks that appear superficially to look a little bit like snails, but they are indeed cephalopods, and while the Nautilus is the only example of such a shelled cephalopod around today, it's thought that ammonites were actually more closely related to our soft-bodied companions, the octopuses and squids. Like the Nautilus, though, the ammonite shell was chambered and buoyant, with the animal itself living in the final chamber. Anything approaching this chamber would be met with, well, Here's the thing, we don't know. We do know they were cephalopods, so we can imagine they had a lot of the standard cephalopod hardware. But soft mollusk tissues don't preserve very well at all. And aside from an ink sac and some stomach contents, there have been almost no impressions of ammonite body forms found yet. Still, shell plumbing suggests a level of buoyancy control, and they would likely have propelled themselves with the jets of water squeezed out of their siphons. Whatever their final details were, they worked. Ammonites were some of the most successful organisms in the history of the planet, and by the Cretaceous they were at their peak, with species ranging in size from just a few millimeters all the way up to the topic of this video. Most ammonites hit somewhere within the size range of a coin to a dinner plate, but one genus has some specimens that go well beyond dinner table. In 1985, in a limestone quarry near the town of Seppenrade in Germany, Laborers breaking the ground uncovered something truly groundbreaking. As a fragment of a gigantic coiled shell was cleared of its surrounding sediment, the true size of this fossil became apparent. It was almost two meters in diameter. This was the largest ammonite fossil ever found, and it still is. But more than that, it is the most massive invertebrate known to science. And it just keeps getting better. The fossil was incomplete. The living chamber of the ammonite was missing, along with a bit of its shell. The complete animal would have been at least 2.5 meters in diameter and perhaps even 3.5 meters across. This genus has around six species in it so far, and all are grouped into the family Desmoceratidae. This family arrived right at the beginning of the Cretaceous, and they are described as a family of fast-moving, predatory ammonites. So their champion, their three-meter Sapenrodensis, would surely have been a force to be reckoned with. But the part of the Parapazosia fossil that is missing is very commonly missing in most ammonite fossils, and is perhaps related to the way these animals would ultimately die. Could the missing living chambers be a ghoulish reminder of the violent ends that awaited these enormous animals? Mosasaur bite marks have been proposed as an explanation for the holes found in some ammonite fossils. But others on closer inspection appeared to be limpet holes instead. Other papers still insist that puncture wounds on several ammonite shells reflect predation by mosasaurs. But one near constant is that when excavating ammonites, large ones in particular, the living chambers of the animal appear to have been bitten off. Could the animal that used to live in the now fossilized shell dug up in Germany in 1895 have come to a grisly end between the teeth of the Cretaceous apex marine lizard? Whatever ate this animal would have come out of the situation well-fed, if not envenomated. Estimates of Parapososia separandensis weight range up to almost 1,500 kilograms. The shell makes up half of this, which makes the meat of our giant cephalopod more than 700 kilograms in weight, around twice the weight of the heaviest known modern-day cephalopod, the colossal squid. But despite its clearly superior mass, Parapazosia was not the surviving example. At the end of the Cretaceous, along with their potential nemeses, the Mosasaurs, all ammonites disappeared. Before we look at why, we'd just like to say thanks for watching, and if you're having fun, help us out by doing all the things the algorithm loves. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, and complain about something in the comments. We really appreciate your engagement in helping us grow the channel. So, after more than 300 million years, the numerous mass extinction events, ammonites finally kicked the bucket 66 million years ago, along with most of the dinosaurs, all of the flying reptiles, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But why, after surviving all those prior catastrophes, what made the Cretaceous so much worse? This is a brilliant topic of discussion and one that's not concluded yet. It's likely that the fallout from the Cretaceous extinction event acidified the oceans, 
This is evidenced by a sharp and disproportionate decrease in shelled animals right after the asteroid collision. There's a period after the extinction events where it appears that the ocean's carbon cycle almost completely stopped. The upper layers of the ocean became more or less uninhabitable, with the planktonic foundation of the food chain struggling. Large animals started to die off in droves. Ammonites, buoyed by their air-filled shells, were essentially trapped in these upper levels and their delicate offspring would have struggled to form shells at all. Reproduction would have become impossible and the aging giants would have become the last of their kind, until finally sinking out of this mortal coil and, if they were lucky enough not to be chewed on by something else, finding their peace at the bottom of the ocean. And it would be here that their relatives, the soft-bodied, sneakier, darkness-dwelling cephalopods, would ride out all the drama occurring in the upper reaches of the ocean, safe in the pitch-black yet remarkably stable environment that hardly ever changes. So it was perhaps a relative of our modern squid, octopuses, and cuttlefish that found the decaying remains of the very last Parapazosia, scoffed it up, and went back to skulking slowly in the dark, waiting for a time that the water above them returned to normal when they could begin repopulating the oceans. Interestingly enough, there's some recent evidence that suggests ammonites may have actually held out for a little bit longer. Evidence of species existing up to around 500,000 years after the extinction event is scant but tantalizing, and it's highly controversial. But it would not be surprising if an animal that survived the great dying also wasn't totally wiped out by a large rock. And if that was the case, perhaps there are even others down there still waiting to be discovered. If you'd like to know more about the nemesis of this Cretaceous ammonite, head over to this video where we'll talk about how it relates to a manhunter that's still around today. And that's all for this video. Thanks again for watching.